Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Can Connect Forum. My name is Jana Marečkova, and I am uh, the new program manager of the Canadian Accessibility Network. Uh, this is actually uh, my second day in this role. Uh, prior to uh, joining Carlton and uh, the CAN team, I spent the last 13 years uh, working uh, in a non-for-profit employment organization, managing employment programs serving people with disabilities. And prior to that, I worked uh, for an international non-governmental organization advocating for rights of persons with mental disabilities. And I also worked uh, for the Czech government on implementing international human rights obligation at the national level. So welcome everybody. Uh, I'm excited to be here and be your host for today's event. We want to begin the event today by acknowledging that the land on which Carlton and Ken National Office is located is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe peoples, and we're grateful to live and work in this beautiful territory. I have a few housekeeping items to share with you before we start the presentations. First of all, the Canadian Accessibility Network is a bilingual network. However, this event will be delivered in English only, and we will be providing captioning in both English and French, as well as ASL interpretation throughout the event as well. Introducing our ASL interpreters is always a good reminder for myself and for our presenters to try and speak at an even moderate pace, not too quickly, so they can capture everything that's being said. There are two ways to view the live transcript. The first way is to enable subtitles within Zoom. You can do this by clicking on the arrow next to the CC button at the bottom of your screen, and then click View Subtitles or View Full Transcript. The second way is through an external link that's been provided by our captioner. We'll be sharing two stream text links in the chat that will open up uh, a separate window with the full transcript. There is one link for the English transcript and one link for the French transcript so that you can follow along in your preferred language. If you cannot see the captions or encounter any technical difficulties during the session, please put a comment in the chat and a member of our event support team will help you troubleshoot. For any attendees who are joining us over the phone, the controls you can use to interact with us during the event are star six to mute or unmute, unmute yourself and star nine to raise or lower your hand. And our last housekeeping note, for those who use screen reader or voiceover supports, we have been made aware that commentary and activity in the chat can be distracting and take away from the presentation and our speakers. It is for this reason that we have adjusted our chat settings today. You will be able to chat directly with me, your host, as well as with my co-hosts, the event support team. If you have any questions, we'll respond to you directly and any comments shared will repeat to you to the group if relevant. Thank you for your understanding. We will now move uh, to the main event. I would like to introduce our two presenters. Uli Egger, Accessibility Specialist at the Rick Hansen Foundation, and Dean Melway, Special Advisor, former director, and the founder of the REED Initiative at Carleton University. Welcome both. I'll invite you now to say a few words about yourselves. Uli, we will start with you. Tell us a bit about yourself, please. Hi, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me clearly. My name is Uli Egger. I'm the Accessibility Certification Specialist for the Rick Hansen Foundation. Uh, for Accessibility Certification, which is also called RHFAC. And I identify as he, him. And I have short gray hair, 
and a beard, and I'm currently wearing a blue shirt and sweater today. Thank you, Uli. Um, Dean? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Dean Melway. I'm an accessibility advisor with Reed, and uh, I also am the lead on implementing the Rick Hansen certification program here at Carleton. And Yuli and I are about the same age, which is a little older than most of you, I would think. And I'm wearing a brown shirt. We're, we're calling today Old Guy Tuesday. <laughs> Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Uli. Uh, we are excited to start the presentation and, and learn from both of you. So Uli, I'll hand it over to you uh, and you can begin. Thank you. Uh, I'm joining you today from the unceded lands of the Kwantlen and Coast Salish people. Our collective work in accessible, accessibility addresses inclusion and belonging. And in the spirit of truth and reconciliation, let us remember and recognize First Peoples and continue to strive for true inclusion and belonging. Next slide, please. You can see a great picture of Rick Hansen back in 1986. 1985 marked the beginning of Rick Hansen's journey that took him around the world to raise awareness for spinal cord injury. This journey took two years, two months, and two days to complete. At the time, there were no accessible buses, healthcare support was minimal for SEI, and there was little peer support. There were no wound clinics, and visiting a doctor was challenging. And also might point out there was no cell phones and there was no internet. That began to change as Rick's travels were reported on global TV, CBC, CTV, etc. A few of us heard of this ambitious guy and his dream, and we were in awe of his toughness and determination for this grueling task. His message was being heard. That same year, I met my now significant other, Kim, who sustained a cervical spinal cord injury the year before, and I was taken aback by her level of energy and ambition. We started off as friends and started to date during Expo 86. Some of you are too young to remember Expo 86, but it was a great time. It showcased the first accessible bus, SkyTrain, and venues that provided access for all, although some of the sites still required a back entrance to get to the venue. We continued to follow Rick's progress and were hopeful that a cure for spinal cord injury was just around the corner. Well, that corner was longer than we thought, but thanks to Rick's journey, the Praxis Spinal Cord Institute was created, and the research that is being done there has bettered the lives of people living with SCI or spinal cord injuries and other disabilities. Fast forward to two, 2017, Kim was at a peer support coffee group where she heard about the pilot program called the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification. They called me and they said, hey, Uli, you'd be great at this and you're retired. You're not doing anything else. Go apply. And I had taken an early retirement and I really was enjoying my life doing tinkering things around the house and just having fun. But I quickly, quickly realized that this was the best thing that I'd ever been involved with. It took what advocates were doing to a whole new level. We were looking at rating sites for mobility, vision and hearing and other disabilities, identifying the barriers that prevent us from living, working and playing. Next slide, Rowan. And Rowan's my partner in crime in the background here. Uh, this is our agenda today, why accessibility matters, about RHF accessibility certification, the process, deliverables, and questions and answers. And Dean and I will both be tackling questions and answers at the end. This slide reads, why does accessibility matter? One in five Canadian adults is currently living with a disability, and this is growing as our population ages. Canadians struggle every day to access the places where we live, work, learn, and play because of physical barriers to accessibility. An accessible built environment benefits everyone, small children, parents with strollers, older adults and seniors, and people with temporary and permanent disabilities. In Canada, almost 50% of adults have or have experienced a permanent or temporary physical disability or live with someone who has. The text on this slide says disability touches the lives of almost 50% of Canadians, not just people with disability, but their family and friends too. 
when my wife Kim sustained a cervical spinal cord injury as a young person, her SCI affected more than just Kim. There was an impact on her family and friends. Just think about the trickle down effect and how many lives her injury impacted. Recently, I was at a family dinner at our uncle's assisted living home. There were six of us family members and five of us had some form of disability. The obvious one was my, Kim, was my wife, Kim, who uses a mobility device, a wheelchair, and possibly her 90-year-old uncle. And at 90, he's got a whole lot of things going on. Our 55-year-old cousin had a temporary Achilles heel injury, and he's actually still using a cane. Our aunt had a foot injury, and she's 80, and she won't use a cane or even acknowledge that she needs to use a cane. I have arthritis, and I'm hard of hearing. And the last one in our group just didn't complain. If you build a code, you're only building for 30% of people with disabilities and missing out on the other 70%. Code really only looks at mobility and does not address vision and hearing disabilities and neural disabilities. Accessibility matters to us and our friends. When we go out for dinner, and we do that a lot, we always phone first and choose a venue that will accommodate all of us. Collectively, we have a lot of expendable cash to spend, and if the business we are visiting isn't accessible, we will go elsewhere. That's lost revenue for any business that's not accessible for all people. 21% of Canadians would support a certified accessible business. And I suspect that number would be higher if people thought about the loss of revenue resulting from not being accessible. What is the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification? So RHFAC. And that's a quite a mouthful, so bear with me. It's a national rating system that measures and certifies the level of meaningful access to sites for persons with vision, hearing, and mobility disabilities. Code does not address the real needs of people with disabilities. RHFAC goes beyond code, and only trained RHFAC professionals are allowed to conduct ratings. It awards certification based on minimum requirements, and it provides an opportunity for sites to showcase achievement. That's bragging rights. You can have that plaque outside your door. Rowan's gonna share a video with you here. Thanks, Rowan. Sorry to interrupt. I don't know. Um, I'm missing the audio on on my end here. That would apply to me too. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. I wasn't sure if that was just well, for me. The fortunate thing is that that it is captioned. Would you like her to uh, Rowan to try playing it again? Yes, please. Okay. Sorry about that. Person, there we go. It means freedom. It means independence. Well, it's important to me because of just dignity. You don't want to have to rely on someone. You don't want to have to feel excluded. You can have a ramp, but if that ramp leads you to a space that you can't actually use the rest of the features that everyone else can, then it's not truly accessible. The gap between what people with disabilities really need and code compliance is just enormous. The RHFAC is a proven industry tool that gives owners and operators a detailed assessment of their current level of accessibility 
and a roadmap to bridging that gap. We had our facilities here assessed. That was really a revelation for us. In the scorecard that we got, there were some things that we could do to make it even more accessible for very little or no cost. In our environment here, diversity is key. Making sure that we have an organization that is open to everyone and accessible to all is the way we're going to innovate. We really felt like this was the next step for us to have our physical space really reflect the accessibility we have in our life. For a lot of us, we don't even know where to begin, but the Rick Hansen Foundation gives you your beginning. The process was quite easy. I think it's really opened the eyes of a lot of the property managers right across the country with everybody jumping in and wanting to help and get certified themselves. For people signing, the level of light is really important in order to communicate. That's a remarkable example of how the built environment and features in that environment affect all people with disability. If accessibility is a barrier, you don't know that without the rating. People are coming to our programs because of the accessibility that we have here. And since being partnered with the Rick Hansen Foundation, we've had other cities from across Canada want to use our best practices. From a business perspective, you're able to draw upon a much larger pool of talent in terms of your employees, and you're also able to attract a much larger customer base. Our hope and our ambition is that RHFAC becomes the global standard for making buildings more accessible. A space like this allows me to feel independent, a part of the community, and that I actually matter. And that's the one thing that RHF is really good at doing, is helping to remove the frustration so that everybody can feel included all the time. Our rating system and training programs have been successful right across Canada, and now we've begun to reach an international market. There's benefits to our staff, there's benefits to our community, there's benefits to our partners, our builders. We need to be accessible and having gold certifications and, and certified facilities, it just tells us that we're on the right track. Thanks, Rowan. Sorry, everyone, for the technical glitch there, but uh, it looks like it has worked out just fine. One of the key aspects of the RHFAC program is the importance of meaningful access. What is meaningful access? Meaningful access is based on real inclusion, not a one size fits all approach. It addresses the real needs of the community. It recognizes the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's code based without being code centric. And RHFAC, RHFAC considers location, occupancy, site conditions, and community as contributing factors in any given facility. We are in Vancouver, Alberta, Ontario, and Halifax, so coast to coast. To date, after 1,967 completed ratings, roughly 30%, 38% of the buildings rated a score under the points required to achieve RHF accessibility certified status. That's quite a large number. To date, approximately 6.3% of completed ratings have achieved gold level and 864 certified sites are currently publicly listed on the registry hosted by the CSA group. These are some of the sites that were rated as gold certified and I'm, if you can't read them all, um, they are the Bentle Kennedy, Trio Vest, Colliers, YVR, which is a, a spectacular airport, Ottawa Airport, Canada Science and Tech Museum, and Husky Energy and Mosaic Stadium. RHFAC has two levels of certification. In order to be RHF accessibility certified, the site must meet the certification prerequisites and must have a rating score of at least 60%. To be RHF accessibility certified gold, the site must meet gold certification prerequisites and have a score rating of at least 80%. And from my previous slide, you can see that not that many sites actually hit gold. These are some of the existing sites that we rate. These are the features that we rate within them. So everything from vehicular access, which is your parking, uh, interior circulation would be your hallways and doors and doorways, et cetera. Sanitary facilities would be your washrooms. The RHFAC rating survey is organized into 10 categories that represent key areas or systems that directly impact the meaningful access level of a site. Each category is further broken down into elements which in turn have features. Points are assigned to each feature according to a rating scale with the total points used to indicate the overall site rating and certification level. 
this next slide is me being able to talk to you about what I see here. So uh, for you, you see uh, lots of parking spaces, accessible parking spaces, and you see some hashtagged areas that are marked. Um, and I see different things here. So I do see uh, two spots here that have uh, an access aisle that have a pedestrian pathway that leads to the site's entrance. The other ones have an access aisle that's nice and wide, I, I give it that, but there's no way of uh, safely getting from that point to the sidewalk safely without having to travel behind or in front of vehicles. There's good signage on the surface, but the pole signage is a little on the low side. So if there's vehicles parked in those spaces, you don't know if they're all, all taken or if there's just one taken. So we recommend, recommend signage that is uh, a lot higher than that, like about 1.5 meters. This is probably about one meter in, in height. And you can see the spaces are wide and uh, you know, it's level, it's easy to uh, transfer. And you know, nowadays we have a lot of people that are using vans uh, to use uh, for their mobility devices, if that's what they're using. But this also accommodates cars and vans. Uh, it's a quite, quite a nice setup. Next slide, please. This next one is a washroom and you're gonna look at this washroom and you're gonna say, wow, this is really great. This has a lot of good things going on. Well, in fact, it does. It has some really good things. It has grab bars that are wall-mounted and L-shaped so that you can use it to pull yourself up if you need the, uh, that uh, one grab bar to pull, pull yourself up. It also has one available on the transfer side of the toilet for people that might need that side of the, uh, of, of the grab bar for transferring, et cetera. It has a toilet lid that acts as a seat back. So a lot of people that have spinal cord injuries or other mobility related disabilities have limited core strength. And imagine if that seat wasn't there, you'd be leaning right against the pipe in the back there. And that's not very comfortable. And for a lot of people, they may just actually go home just because they can't use that toilet. And if that toilet was mounted too low, which in this case it isn't, it's mounted at a, at a great height, uh, they also might just have to go home because they might be able to transfer down onto it, but wouldn't be able to transfer back up. We notice that there's toilet paper dispenser, it's open roll, which is what we prefer because you can use a closed fist uh, to bat that toilet paper and uh, open it up and use it. However, it's kind of mar mounted a little far away from the toilet. So there's a falling hazard there. And the falling hazard brings me to those two buttons that are up there. One's a locking button and one is a emergency call button. So if you fall in on the floor, and that happened to my wife, Kim, at a community center once. She actually had to drag herself all the way to the door that you see there, and not at this site, but similar, and uh, because there was no emergency call button. And in this case, there is one, but if you were down on the floor and you had limited mobility, you may not be able to reach that call button. So that, that's uh, an issue. So we look at uh, two heights or a few heights. And there's also a height adjustable adult change table in here which is really great. So if you, this was an office tower, which it's not, but if it was, uh, and you were working at your place and you needed to change your pants, uh, you would have a place to do that. You could actually fold this down. It all does everything electronically for you. You could fold it down and get on there and maybe only miss an hour's worth of work than having to go home and miss a whole day's worth of work. And uh, that's a big issue for a lot of people in the, in the community, uh, being able to have dignity and to be able to uh, get changed if they need to get changed. You also notice that there's a child change table in this one. Not every place has a child change table. That's a nice feature. And uh, it's mounted slightly high, but you could actually wheel underneath there. And uh, if you had a child, you could change your child's diaper. Or maybe it's even a, a little older of a child that uh, requires a little bit of uh, assistance. And the other thing I would note in here is that the lighting is not that great. It's a little bit on the dark side. So uh, we'll move on to the next slide. These are some of our partners. The next slide, we have an advisory committee that is comprised of industry professionals from coast to coast. This ensures that the program, RHFAC, meets the needs of industry and clients. This platform reviews RHFAC materials used for the professional handbook and rating survey through dis discussion, collaboration, and partnership. 
And these are some of the people that are on our advisory committee. And I'm not going to read them all off. Uh, I, I think I'm probably going to end up going over time here anyway. So uh, they are from a wide variety of business. And you can see them on there that they come from many different uh, uh, spaces and places in Canada. We have a technical subcommittee. The technical subcommittee consists of accessibility professionals, consultants, and community leaders. It consists of... Uh, uh, the, the goal is, sorry, I'm repeating myself, to stay at the forefront of innovation and access by developing an updated rating survey every three years. And we're actually working on the, the latest version right now, uh, which is going to be version 4.0. Collect and incorporate ongoing feedback from disability organizations, people with disabilities, and RHFAC professionals. So we have a real mixed uh, group of people that are on this committee. We have a relationship with the CSA group. Our online registry is hosted by the CSA group. All ratings are adjudicated and given final approval by the CSA group. Only sites that have agreed to list publicly will be shown on the RHFAC registry. And the exam for the RHFAC professionals taken upon course completion is administered by the CSA group. We are internationally recognized. You can see some of the different uh, places that have recognized us in a very meaningful way. B651, which is CSA, is an internationally recognized access standard, and that's what we base a lot of our, our work on. Green Build is the world's biggest Green Build conference, and the RHFAC received an award in innovation from RHFAC training at the 2020 Zero Conference in Vienna. Benefits versus costs. So on this screen, it says be a visionary, be inclusive, everyone wins differentiate and future-proof. So future-proof is build with foresight to reduce retrofit risks as code catches up. You gotta reduce waste and carbon footprint by not having to completely renovate. So just think about that. If you build a site that is uh, adaptable, highly adaptable, you may only have to do some minor changes to make it accessible. Buildings which are not designed to be accessible are not sustainable. Think about the aging demographics and who the user is. Leadership, have an aspirational goal of RHFAC accessibility certified gold for all new building projects. RHFAC cost comparison and feasibility study was done by HCMA in January of 2020. The average increase in construction cost to achieve RHFAC gold is 1%. By building to RHFAC certified or certified gold, future improvements will be less costly as new innovations and in accessibility improve. And as I mentioned, we are working on version four, but we keep looking for the best innovations for our next version of the handbook. It is zero dollars for new builds to achieve RHF accessibility certification when thoughtful planning and design is applied, zero dollars. Buildings or sites can achieve RHF accessibility certified or RHF certified gold by scoring at least 60% or 80% respectfully on the RHFAC rating survey. The RHFAC cost comparison feasibility study completed by HCMA shows that using the RHFAC rating score for site built using national building code would only achieve 35%. A similar score of 42% would be achieved using Ontario building code slightly better, but still not RHF accessibility certified. Now I'm gonna mention this again, by building to RHFAC certified or certified gold, future improvements will be less costly as new innovations in accessibility improve. You will reduce waste and carbon footprint by not having to completely renovate. There are two fees associated with an RHFAC rating. The first fee is the application fee, which costs $2,350 and taxes. This covers the administration of the RHFAC registry, the adjudicator review, and the confirmation of certification and online RHFAC registry listings. The second fee is the RHFAC rating fee. This is determined by and negotiated between the client and the professional to conduct the on-site rating. The RHFC rating and the RHFC regis registry for adjudication are all accounted for this. Fees, fees vary based on size and complexity of the site. And an example of this would be a single story 
building versus a stadium, vastly different in scope. Some professionals may have expertise in certain areas, such as large stadiums, and some might have areas that uh, specialize in travel. Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Training, or RHFAC for short, is available at a variety of campuses across Canada, is also available online to the University of Athabasca. The training provides the fundamental skills and knowledge required to rate a site using the RHFAC common methodology. The prerequisites to take the course are experience in the built environment that include architects, engineers, interior design, facilities managers, et cetera. And that might include life experience as well. RHFAC professionals must complete the RHFAC training course and the professional exam administered by the CSA group. Only RHFAC professionals can conduct RHFAC ratings. Taking the training will change the way you look at the built environment. It absolutely changed the way I look at things. Challenge yourself and others to take the training. Our courses are available right across the country. And you see Vancouver Community College, uh, Southern Alberta Institute of Technology, George Brown College, Carleton University, and you all know where that is, Nova Scotia Community College, and it is available online at the Athabasca University. There are tuition grants for accessibility education. If you are interested in taking the RHFAC training course to learn how to rate buildings for meaningful accessibility, you may be eligible for a grant to cover the cost of tuition. There are many ways to qualify for tuition grants, and I will post the website at the end for anyone who is interested in finding out more. And Roanne will move the slides around at the end so that you can have a good grasp of what we are offering. To date, 340 plus people have taken the course, and we have 146 members. The Accessibility Professional Network. This is something that uh, you subscribe to every year and for 225 dollars you get the APN uh, network which provides the following benefits you get educational tools and resources professional development and networking opportunities there's an industry job board and an online discussion for forum and Roanne will post this again later uh, about where you can find out about this so for the professional fee so if you become uh, an RHFAC professional it's $225 a year. If you're an associate, so somebody that's interested in creating a Canada that's accessible for all, it's also $225. And if you're a student, it's only $50 a year for your first year. What can you do? You can challenge yourself and others to take the RHFAC training as part of your ongoing professional development. You can incorporate RHFAC into your accessibility policy. Set a goal for achieving RHFAC gold for all your projects and get rated. Ensure that any new projects or renovations include the participation of an RHFAC professional. This could be you. And I've got to tell you that I've presented to many different architecture firms. And at the end of them, usually all of them say, well, we're going to take this training because we didn't really learn that much about uh, accessibility in our training. So uh, I think we'll save the questions. I think the next slide is questions. We'll save that till after Dean has presented uh, his presentation. And uh, uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Dean. And Dean, uh, thanks for uh, giving me a little extra time here today. Not a problem, Yuli. So I'm just waiting for Michaela to put me up on the screen. There you are. And uh, do you wanna put it in? There we go, thank you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're implementing the RHFAC here at Carleton, but I, I want to start, and you can go to the next slide, I want to start by talking a little bit about Rick Hansen and how important he has been to our implementation of the, uh, our whole development of accessibility here at Carleton. And uh, of course, which led to us being one of the places that teaches the course, as well as uh, the first university to to commit to it fully um, assessing the campus. So we're in the process now of, of fully assessing the campus. And uh, so it, it was October 27, 2011, that 
we held the first meeting to discuss the idea of an accessibility institute at Canada, and we used that as an opportunity to, uh, or Rick, Rick used that as an opportunity to come and, uh, and join with us as, as he celebrated the 25th anniversary of his Man in Motion World Tour. Uh, next slide. So that beautiful sculpture there, which uh, was the, the was the first sort of logo for Reed, was uh, was actually um, carved on campus, chainsaw carved on campus, by a gentleman named David Fells, and we actually la launched the Reed Initiative as a result of the, that sculpture being placed in the River Building, which is now the Richcraft Building. So if you're on campus. It's in the lobby of the Richcraft Building. You'd love to go over and see it. And uh, it was dedicated to Rick's 25th anniversary, to Carleton's commitment to accessibility, and to the uh, children of David Fels, the, the, uh, the sculptor who, who made it. So Rick made a big difference to us. He, he, he helped us launch the Reed Initiative. Next slide. But he continued to help us because once we launched the Reed Initiative, we started to sort of try to influence the planning that was going on at Carleton. And we petitioned or, or we spoke at the uh, planning meetings leading to the 2013 to 2018 Strategic Integrated Plan. And because of that, or, and along with other folks on campus who support accessibility, there, there was a goal set to be the most accessible university in Canada. And so that was sort of the preliminary commitment that Carleton made to, to become accessible. And of course, starting the Reed Initiative was, was part of that. We then hosted an international symposium on accessibility in, in uh, 2014. And, and in, it was a big undertaking. And in order to get that to even happen, we needed a couple of preconditions pre before the university would consider doing it. One of those was a commitment by Rick Hansen to be our plenary speaker, to be the, the final speaker. The second was a commitment from the province of Ontario to assist with the funding. Uh, because we had those two things, the university embraced the event and it was, it was sort of the real launch of Carleton's reputation as a, a leader in accessibility. Uh, what we've done now with the Reed Initiative is we've created two, two important uh, uh, bodies. Uh, they were actually, when we got to the, the current strategic integrated plan, they're actually referred to as the, as the things we have to do. And the first one is, is CAN, or second on your list there, but I'm saying CAN now because here you are at a CAN event. And uh, it's, it's these kind of events to share information on accessibility across the country and around the world, actually, that, that uh, become an important part of what Carlton's trying to do. The second is, is CAS, which is the Carlton uh, Accessibility Strategy. And the, you, can, you can move, uh, oh, don't move just yet, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. I just wanted to say that that uh, CAS is the vehicle through which we have de determined that the Rick Hansen certification program is what we need to implement. So we have these two important organizations that are part of REED and have put REED on the map, so to speak. And actually on the 27th of October, a week, a, a week and a bit ago, uh, Carlton actually celebrated the 10th anniversary of REED and at the end of the celebration, the president stood up and said, we are now gonna rename Carleton, Carleton's Reed Initiative to the Carleton University Accessibility Institute. And if you, if you saw the slide at the beginning, we set out with the goal of creating an accessibility institute and in 10 years, we now have it. So from, from here on forward, uh, Reed becomes the Carleton University Accessible Institute. Next slide. So our coordinated accessibility strategy had seven components and the middle component highlighted there is the physical campus. And that's the one I wanted to talk a little bit about. And next slide. So the, the main objectives of the physical campus uh, area were, were to uh, standards for accessibility of the camp, physical campus that go beyond the minimum requirements. And, and with that as our, our objective, 
we, we have a series of goals, but the first one, which isn't listed here, was to, to set a standard that is above the minimum. And so Carlton effectively uh, it, it adopted the Rick Hansen certification program as its standard. In other words, what happens now is that every building on campus has to be at least certified. And every building that is new or new builds that come to campus have to be certified gold. So we've begun that process and uh, we're, in, we're in, the, in the process of doing basically 20 buildings a year and we've got a little over 50 buildings. So it's kind of a three year plan to assess all the buildings on campus and make sure that every one of them at least meets certified and, and the ones that are new, new construction the, the goal is certified gold. Now, most of our buildings will meet that requirement because we have a, uh, a very accessible campus. We have uh, a tunnel system that connects every building. We have a, a accessible entrances to the, on the outside to every building. All buildings have at least some accessible washrooms, some need more. Uh, and so most of the work that has been done over the past 30 years of trying to create an, a, a, an accessible environment here at Carleton will put us in a good position. But what we find is using the Rick Hansen Certification Program assessment, we find things that can be fixed that aren't gonna be uh, change our rating really, but are gonna make our campus more usable and more friendly to everyone. And so while we are developing a list and making sure that if there's anything that prevents us from being certified, that that's, that gets priority. We are also identifying the low hanging fruit and moving toward that. So we, we, have a, we have a continued commitment to the elimination of existing barriers on our campus. We have a whole community that is, is involved in the process. When we, when we assess buildings, we're, we work with the building authority, we talk to all the departments in, in each building and make sure that they're aware that, that the opportunity to identify issues is there and that, that we have a, a, a process now on campus to be able to bring things to the fore and identify them. Our, we're working hand in hand with our, our facilities management planning group and they're going to be working with us to cost out all the changes that we identify and uh, we're starting to work toward a budget that would allow us to eliminate those barriers. Uh, next step for us is going to be uh, looking at all the policies and practices regarding the use of space and make sure that uh, we're not creating problems by virtue of just the policies that we use. So next slide is says, thank you. And I look forward to having the opportunity to answer any questions that you have. And thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Uli. It's uh, great to hear all that information about the certification and training developed by the Rick Hansen Foundation, as well as uh, all about all the initiatives uh, related to accessibility and built environment that have been going on at Carleton University. So thank you very much, both of you. Um, Unless you have any final thoughts uh, to share with us, I will invite everybody to um, pose any questions and share comments and resources in the chat. Um, so I will give you some time to type your questions. You can also raise your hand. Uh, if you are joining us over the phone, I will just remind you that uh, the way to raise your hand is to pre press star nine. I, I would like to uh, just interject for a second and thank Carleton University and Dean for their commitment uh, to rating all their sites within Carleton University and you know, rating them for meaningful access. And I know I, wor I work with Dean on, on some of these projects uh, indirectly. I'm the adjudicator for the program. And Dean doesn't sugarcoat it. He looks at a site and he follows the rating survey and uh, really identifies which areas are being done really well and which areas uh, require some TLC, as he, as he would put it. So he's doing a great job. And Carlton, thank you so much. Thank you, Uli. 
Uh, I'll just quickly go over the questions that are in the chat right now. Um, question about recording. Yes, uh, this session is being recorded and we will share the recording with everybody who attended. Uh, a question about sharing the slide decks. Uh, Dean and Uli, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I believe that uh, the can will make those available. Yeah, I, I think Roanne can make that available. I think it'll be within the recording as well. Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, there was a question for Uli. What does CSA stand for? Ah, that's a great question. So Canadian Standards Association. Those are the people that uh, certify your light bulbs, your fixtures, your fridges, your stoves, your ovens. Uh, anything to do with safety is a Canadian Standards Association uh, area of expertise and they are all over North America, not just in Canada. Great, thank you. Um, okay, we'll move on to the questions that uh, I, I see Scott has his hand up. So please, Scott, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, two great presentations and I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Scott Allardyce. I'm a senior policy advisor in the Ontario Government Accessibility Office. Part of my job is I am leading uh, accessibility discussions related to uh, the redesign of the McDonald Block Complex in Toronto, which is the largest Ontario government complex in the province. Um, we have a number of accessibility issues with uh, uh, with the project to ensure that it not only meets current accessibility standards, but also future accessibility standards. So I guess my my question is um, how how we let me see if I can phrase this properly. How do we know that we're actually making a good uh, case for accessibility. There are a number of issues because the site is also a heritage site. So there are often um, different pressures on the discussion between maintaining heritage, but also maintaining accessibility. And so I was just wondering if the two panelists could give me some um, advice or clarification on how you deal with those issues. Dean, would you like to go first? Well, I would just say that uh, heritage buildings have been a big issue for a lot of accessibility advocates because they they find it uh, it's 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 like pulling teeth to get any real access and change. But that picture is changing, and it's changing partially because of the uh, the federal government legislation, which has just come. The Canadian Accessibility Act is just coming into it, it, its law now, but the standards and such have not been set yet and they're working on that. And uh, so I think the picture in the future is gonna be a lot brighter in terms of finding finding solutions. Like I, I know that here in Ottawa, we have, uh, we have the Canadian Museum of Nature, which is a heritage building and I've just completed an accessibility certification for them. They achieved gold, or they didn't achieve gold, but they achieved certification. And their aspiration is to achieve gold. And so they are finding uh, ways around the issues and, and negotiating with the Heritage Committee. So it's, it's, uh, it's possible and it's, it's gonna get easier. Yeah, our RHFAC uh, can work for almost any type of site. Well, it does work for any type of site. It, it's a way of identifying the barriers for meaningful access. So it's, really a way of going through any site that's in Canada and from top to bottom, uh, everything from the main entrance to the washrooms to uh, emergency egress. Uh, how do you get out of the building in the event of an emergency? And we look at all those different uh, features within a site. And so it doesn't really matter if it's a heritage building. Uh, RHFAC is part of the consideration for uh, the reform of center block for parliament. Uh, it, uh, the rely on a lot of what we do. Uh, Labs Canada now relies on what we do. Uh, we're all part of that uh, infrastructure for new construction. And 
it, it uh, it's nice to see that uh, we are considering that it is 2022 and that people should be able to enjoy, whether it's a heritage building or a brand new building, everybody should be in to, to be able to enjoy it, whether you're a hard of hearing or a deaf person, a blind person or partial sighted person or a mobility uh, person. You should be able to enjoy all the same things that every other Canadian enjoys. Thank you both. We will now move on to uh, the question by a participant who joined us over the phone. The phone number ends with 7337. I believe we cannot hear the question. No. Okay, we'll try again later. Um, Mark, your question is next. So I just have a question uh, for Uli. I'm wondering why the Rick Hansen Foundation standard for washroom doesn't recognize ceiling mounted lifts when in the United Kingdom there is a standard and they have eight, over eight, about 1800 of mm -hmm. washrooms having ceiling mounted lifts. And in Canada, we are just desperately behind. So I'm wondering we why are. why we, we don't acknowledge the importance of ceiling mounted lists in washrooms. So this will be addressed in the next version of the handbook. It uh, hasn't been part of CSA and it hasn't been a part of a lot of other standards within Canada. Um, however, as you mentioned, it is available in many other countries and, and United Kingdom is a good example. And we will be tackling that in our next version of the handbook. Next question is uh, from Erica in the chat. Uh, what are some good free resources to look at building or product accessibility standards? That's an easy one. You can get uh, B651-18 uh, and perhaps 22 when it comes out for free. It's, it's a free download. And uh, it has lots of diagrams, has lots of good verbiage uh, that you can get a basic idea of what the built environment should look, look, look like. Uh, if you base it on code and, and look for code alone, code doesn't really meet the needs of ex uh, accessibility standards for a lot of people, as mentioned in my uh, uh, presentation. It really only covers about 30% of people with disability. And we're trying to break down barriers for meaningful access for all people. Everybody should be able to use all spaces equally. Thank you, Uli. Uh, we have a question from Omar. What are the elements of the Rick Hansen rating survey? That's that's a big question. There's a <laughs> there are 544 features within the rating survey, so it uh, there's a lot to go through, and we have a many different categories. And I think I touched on it a little bit uh, in the beginning. There's uh, how do you get to the site? That could be transit, could be drop off at the entrance, it could be parking. We then, that's our very first category that you would look at. And within that uh, category, there are elements and they, they are in turn turned into features. So identifying everything from the dimensions of the parking spaces to the signage that's within the parking spaces. Can you safely get from those parking spaces to the uh, uh, main sidewalk if there's a sidewalk? If there are curb ramps, identifying those curb ramps, are they low slope? Are there tactile indicators at the top of the uh, curb ramps? Uh, is there contrast for people that have uh, low vision? Uh, there, there's all sorts of things that are identified line by line, and it's not a checklist. You actually have to provide uh, information to uh, the adjudicator and to for your project on every single line and uh, you go through it methodically. And it uses common methodology uh, that is used by all professionals across the country. And Dean is one of those professionals. Great, thank you. Uh, Kathy, your question is next. Hi there. Hi. Um, thank you so much for um, the work that you guys are, are doing. Uh, it's extremely meaningful. And um, I, I want to come from the lens of um, looking at non-visible uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. So um, my, my team is aware that this is uh, uh, something that's very close to my heart. And I recognize with the Rick Hansen standard that um, you have to start somewhere, right? So, you know, it, absolutely crucial. Um, but my area of 
interest is particularly around mental health. And when we look at the rates of disability in uh, Canada, um, the, we're in an unprecedented mental health crisis that's not going away anytime soon. Yes. And so I'm curious, um, knowing that there are standards that the Canadian Standards Association have worked on, I mean, there's a voluntary one for, for post-secondary, but there is like psychological uh, wellness standards for the workplace, that sort of thing. I'm wondering if there are future plans uh, around this, um, how we might be able to look at the built environment uh, through a lens that is more supportive of mental health. You know, that's a really great question. Uh, firstly, I must uh, just uh, say that we are our, a reference standard. We are not a standard, so we're not like CSA B651, but we're a reference standard that continuously evolves and uh, picks up on the best practices from around the world. Uh, in our next version of the handbook, we're looking at neurodiverse uh, uh, people with disability that uh, uh, haven't typically been picked up uh, in any rating anywhere in the country or even acknowledged by anybody in the country. So we're looking at you know autism and the spectrum, uh, et cetera. And there's so much work to be done and there's so many good things that you can do for people to make them feel welcome and comfortable and uh, using universal design so that everyone can use the same space, whether you have mental health issues or you have a mobility disability or a vision disability, that you can easily access that site in a meaningful way and feel comfortable and safe and just be able to utilize that space to the best of your ability. I would just like to uh acknowledge Kathy. Uh, I talked about the accessibility strategy at Carlton. She's the lead of it. Mm. And, uh, and not only that, she's a student working on her master's focusing on mental health and the built environment. So we, uh, we look for the opportunity to uh, of your findings, Kathy, and the opportunity for us to improve uh, the, the certification program as a result of that. Thank you so much. And we would like to hear more from you, Kathy. Oh, well, sure, that'd Thank be you. great. Thank you. Great. Uh, I will ask the participant who joined us over the phone if uh, they're still interested in uh, asking a question. Um, star six is the way to unmute yourself. Did you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Uh, Dean Maui, it's Jay Oswald phoning. I don't know if you remember me. I remember sure you from years ago when you helped handicap people in the pool in Kitchener. Nice to hear from you. You remember me? I do. Wow. <laughs> well, if Mark gives you my phone number, could we stay in touch? We could indeed. Mark is uh, connected with my uh, group for the blind. It would be an honor to speak to you uh, in, in a greater length. Look forward to hearing from you through through Ken. You can give me. Uh, thank you so much, Mark. I'll give you, uh, Mark. I'll give you my contact information, and uh, we'll be in touch. I, all I can do is by phone because of my vision impairment. I will call you, and we'll stay in touch that way. Thank you so That's much. Good. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other comments or raised hands. Michaela, is there anybody else? Can you help me if I missed anybody? No, I don't see anyone else. Great. Uh, so other questions? Uh, I would like to thank Uli and Dean again for their time today and for sharing all the information. Uh, it's, it's, it's really great to learn about uh, all of this and uh, built environment standards in accessibility. Um, we at the CAN National Office would like to invite you to our next event to celebrate the 2022 International Day of Persons with Disabilities. The Canadian Accessibility Network and Statistics Canada will be co-hosting a panel on deaf blindness on Monday, December 5th from noon to one o'clock via Zoom. It will be an informative and insightful session. And we invite you all to register for this upcoming event 
uh, through the link that we'll be sharing in the chat. We will also be sharing a link to our feedback form, which we ask that you all please fill out to help us keep developing and improving these CAM events. Uh, one recommendation I'd like to make. Please. Uh, please always make sure you have Zoom access available. I mean, the phone access available because I will never have a computer, but this is a wonderful way to, to communicate. Thank you for the feedback. So thank you all for attending today. And if you have any questions or would like to get any information about getting involved in the Canadian Accessibility Network, please uh, contact us and the national office at ken at carlton.ca. This email address uh, will be also shared in the chat. And you can also get in touch with uh, rickhanson.com, become accessible and learn about accessibility training and education tuition grants. Great. Thank you, Uli. Uh, we hope to see or hear you all at our next event. Uh, thank you and have a great afternoon, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Okay, I think we're good there. Aiden, you can stop the recording now and then I can.